But now we have to shift gears. The life. Echoing Monet, Nypha, and Smith's book is 951 pages of unrelenting, misbegotten misery. And that's not even counting their footnotes, which run to another 5,000 pages, which they had to publish online to save, what, a few more forests. This painting was done soon after the infamous Christmas breakdown in 1888. By this time, his behavior had become so erratic that the cops had dragged him from the yellow house back to the hospital two or three times in a single month. You can almost see the change in his expression. The wind is leaving his sails. Soon enough, he would write his brother, we don't have to live for great ideas any longer. The life overwhelms the reader with just how much delusion and disillusionment one man could generate in a brief span of 37 years. For example, when was the last time you had a disagreement with your father? Does senior year in high school ring a bell? You probably dealt with it, patched things up, and moved on, or went to a college back east and let things cool out for a while. Vincent returned from a disastrous attempt at becoming a minister, like his father, and had to move back into his parents' home. Broke, destitute, sick. Then he proceeded to argue with his father at least once a day for close to two years' time. One of his own sisters accused him of causing the stroke that killed their father. He systematically destroyed every relationship he ever had, often several times over. The book debunks much of the romanticized, misunderstood, anguished, suffering artist hype that we've been handed for a hundred and some odd years. It draws instead a thoroughly bleak picture of a seriously diseased and unbalanced person with a manipulative and even conniving personality disorder. Make that plural. In a recent article in The Guardian, a writer proposed that it was actually Gauguin who lopped off Vincent's ear with his fencing gear. Read this book, and you're almost ready to buy that. We learn how exhausting he must have been to live with, a man without a brake pedal, just an accelerator. Gauguin, no slouch himself when it came to personality disorders, was smart enough to know when to just bail. Here's his snarky, passive-aggressive manner in which he got back at Vincent for all of his disagreeableness. Notice the placement of Vincent's thumb. Nypha and Smith end their opus with a 17-page addendum suggesting that a Parisian preppy with a predilection for Wild Bill Hickok outfits and low-caliber handguns was the real culprit who shot Vincent in the wheat field. After 900 pages, my reaction was, yay, Things are finally looking up for old Vinny. At least he didn't kill himself. So to me, the $54 million question becomes, did Vincent know what he was doing in art or in life? The answer, a resounding yes and no. And I'll get back to you on that. I'm going to show you a few more paintings and we'll see if we can leave here today with a little more definitive answer. Here's an early work painted in the same manner that another person might use a shovel and with something of the same color scheme, dirt. Vincent's art dealer little brother, Theo, kept urging him to change his palette. There's a website where you can scroll chronologically through 800 plus paintings of the 900 paintings that we know Vincent created. Those works from the first five or six years of his career look as if he might have been squeezing beef bourguignon out of his tubes and not oil paint. The more Theo told him he wasn't going to make it as a painter until he got with the cool guys like Monet and Degas and Renoir, the more Vincent dug in his heels and kept churning out one muddy mess after another. He had actually never seen an Impressionist painting in real life until, that is, he got to Paris. Not long after his father had died, Vincent knocked out this painting in a single sitting. With oafish symbolism, he added the extinguished candle and the Bible open to the passage on Isaiah, the despised one. Then he threw in his dog-eared copy of Zola's La Joie de Vie for good measure.
when he finally did show up unannounced in Paris, he had sent a telegram for Theo to meet him at the Louvre, Vincent still stuck to his desaturated ways. It was only after he had aggravated Theo to the point where he was going to be kicked out of the apartment that Vincent, in a moment of conscious clarity and inspiration, decided to become an Impressionist. There were obviously some ulterior aesthetic decisions taking place, but really, it was mostly to placate his brother, the benefactor with the checkbook. Vincent knew exactly what he was doing. But then something happens. You can be surfing through all these paintings that look like the Santa Monica Bay after a big rainstorm when you hit this one, and it virtually leaps off the screen. Remember back in the 80s when the media would spout ridiculous things like, let Reagan be Reagan? Well, this is the painting that let Vincent become Vincent. He no longer wanted to be a world-saving minister, a catcher in the wheat, so to speak. Working for the art world was out of the question. He could now say, in truth, painting is in the marrow of my bones. Let me digress for a moment. Back when I was about Vincent's age in Paris, I might as well have been from another planet. Dylan used to sing, I was so much older then, I'm younger than that now. That still makes no sense to me other than to differentiate two points on a calendar. I like the opening sentence in L.P. Hartley's The Go-Between better. It reads, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. One would hope that as we age, we experience a certain amount of introspection and gain at least a little perspective on life on this planet. Then you adapt and modify and hopefully progress. I go through these mini angsty periods every time I put together one of these videos. But seriously, I get over it. With Vincent, it was well beyond angst. I think his every waking hour was hijacked by the deafening noises in his head, racking him with guilt, self-doubt, blame, and a whole host of internal strife. The New Yorker put it this way, the stripping away of conventional decorum that Van Gogh's illness forced on him made him almost unnaturally present, alert to the world. When his mind went wrong, he became all heart. So he heads south to Arles, and like a schoolboy with a crush, he unleashes a furious campaign to get Paul Gauguin to move in with him. Together, they will create the studio of the south. This was his calling card to Gauguin, self-portrait as Japanese bones. His father was the first one to suspect that Vincent's delusions warranted his institutionalization. Everyone else simply coped and said it was Vincent being Vincent, and there was nothing one could do about that. That summer in Arles is when he starts to unhinge in earnest. For a man who was at times so lucid and so intelligent, much more of a bookworm than a madman, it's heartrending to watch as the rope slips loose and his conscious being begins to drift away. But first, when did all these upstart artists start painting themselves? I came across three reasons for the rise of the self-portrait during the late 15th and 16th centuries. The changing status of the artist, they became worthy subjects, what with the continuing secularization of art. The introduction of oil paint, one could paint in the studio, and not just up on the cathedral walls. And my favorite, improved mirrors. Rembrandt painted about 40 self-portraits in oil with possibly an equal number of etching self-portraits over a career lasting 45 years. Vincent painted 37 self-portraits within a three-year window, with this image being suggested as his very first attempt at self-portraiture. Now, similar observations can be made for Vincent and Rembrandt. Their models were cheap, undemanding, and the hours flexible. Critics are inclined to look at Rembrandt's work 
as the pinnacle of depicting the human condition in oil paint. Vincent's work, if possible, cuts a little closer to the bone. Painting over earlier works, ones that his mother neglected to throw out in one of her periodic cleaning binges, Vincent used his time in Paris to hone his skills as a portraitist and as a flavor of the week wielder of a paintbrush. One week an impressionist, one a pointillist, one a closinettist. I have a different theory. For someone who lives such a tempestuous interior existence, it's possible that Vincent used these compulsive self-sittings as a way to gauge what was happening to him on the exterior, or even if there was an exterior with which to engage. So, did he know what he was doing? You can look into those eyes and get one answer to the question. But then look at how he applies paint with this, his magnetic field method, and you just might get a different one. Now, there's always the risk of turning a discussion about Vincent into something like a medical consultation. With that said, his illnesses really do read like a checklist for a hypochondriac first-year med student, probably bipolar, certainly manic-depressive, possibly epileptic, that's where my money's riding, documented alcoholic, self-poisoned with lead paint several times over, overdosed on digitalis, abstinence, hallucinations, Meniere's disease, which is an inner ear imbalance, sunstroke, glaucoma, syphilis, and let's throw in schizophrenia for good measure, n'est-ce pas? One of his critics, and they were never really kind to him until the last month of his life, once said that his mind was one at the boiling point. So granted, he might have been a seriously sick individual who are we kidding? He was a seriously sick individual. But he didn't paint crazy. Was it like that Pink Floyd line, there's someone in my head, but it's not me? Vincent came late to the profession of painting, but he made up for lost time with his dogged self-didacticism. Now, there is a cognitive skill that is called procedural memory. That's where you can remember motor acts, like turning left onto Sunset Boulevard without veering into somebody else's lane. Brain research tells us that it is a type of implicit memory, meaning that your brain holds knowledge of something that your mind cannot explicitly access. So if he didn't paint crazy, how did he paint? He mixed his paints more often than not right there on the canvas. At this point in his career, you just don't see his surface turning muddy. It's uncanny. Now, there are very good painters who wisely mix their paints on a palette, and even they can't escape those deadly murky browns. On the contrary, Vincent's colors have become ultra high frequency. All signal, no noise. He wrote, to attain the high yellow note I attained this summer, there was nothing for it but to step up the dose a little. To be sure, there were large segments of Vincent's brain that were just not right. But then look closely at almost any painting created in the last two years of his life, and you won't find a stroke out of place. 